Hello, I'm Dr. Cinnamon Sullivan, and I'm the Director of Global Health Anesthesiology at Emory University Hospital. Welcome again to the Emory Global Perioperative Alliance Symposium and its very first panel. Without this, I would like to make sure that I, I say a hearty thank you to Dr. Alex Reitz, who is our Emory Global Surgery Fellow for doing a remarkable job of putting this panel together, along with Sovia Stalianos, who is an MD candidate for the class of 2023. So to start this panel locally global, I'd like to say that when we think of global health, we typically think that it is something that is out there. And we forget sometimes that our own communities make up part of that fabric and that whenever we're practicing in a low resource setting, we're seeing a need for better global health. That's why these four panelists are so interesting, because they have a unique perspective on the crucial role that interdisciplinary collaboration play in these settings. So to decrease any technical issues, I'll let you know the format. I'm going to introduce all four of our speakers first. They will then give their talks and then please stay after for our live Q&A. So first off, we're gonna have Dr. Leon Dent. So Dr. Dent is a former colleague of mine who was born and raised in Albany. He attended the Morehouse School of Medicine did a surgery residency at Harlem Hospital and then a trauma critical care fellowship at Mayo Rochester. He initially served when I met him as the trauma director at Grady for Morehouse. He later worked in Nashville and did trauma now in his back hometown of Albany, Georgia at Phoebe Putney Hospital. Next, you're gonna hear from Lynn Tesh. Lynn Tesh has a remarkable career and has been a clinical nurse for over 20 years then went back and got her master's at Emory University. She's worked with Spanish speaking immigrants in Atlanta and communities in Honduras, and also at the Indian Health Services in Crown Point, New Mexico. But currently she is working in the federal prison system in Glynn County. Next, you'll hear from Dr. Susana Samaniego. Dr. Samaniego attended the Chicago Medical School and then did a surgery residency at New York Medical College. Initially, after working locum, she joined the very interesting HEAL initiative at the University of California in San Francisco, and currently is working in the Navajo Medical Center in Shiprock, New Mexico. Finally, you'll hear from Dr. Sean Runnels. Dr. Runnels actually worked in Africa for three years. He initially did a cardiothoracic anesthesia fellowship in Cambridge, but afterwards went on to work on Mercy Ship in West Africa, followed by a two year stint working as a uh, professor at the National University in Rwanda. He holds several patents, patents and airway devices, and we look forward to hearing from him. So for now, I'd like to introduce you again to Dr. Leon Dent. Hello. My name is Leon Dent, and it's a pleasure to be with you today. I am uh, the medical director for trauma services at Phoebe Putney Memorial Hospital in Southwest Georgia uh, in a town called Albany. Uh, Phoebe Putney is the uh, largest supplier of healthcare in Southwest Georgia. It's approximately uh, 690 beds. And uh, we're a major provider of uh, surgical oncology, uh, cardiovascular, uh, robotic surgery, and orthopedic care in the southwest part of the state. Phoebe Putney is the flagship hospital of the Phoebe Putney Health System, uh, comprised of four entities, uh, Phoebe, Maine, that's a large hospital, 690 beds. We perform approximately 15,000 surgeries per year. Uh, we ha also have a sister facility, uh, Phoebe North, no surgeries performed there. Uh, and up until recently, we had a small uh, emergency room there and uh, uh, rehab facilities. Uh, Phoebe Sumter, uh, 76 beds, form approximately 4,000 surgeries there per year. Uh, and Phoebe Sumter is it's, uh, in the next county approximately 40 miles away from Albany. And then Phoebe Worth, 25 beds, um, critical access hospital, no surgical capabilities there. Southwest Georgia uh, comprises approximately 14 counties, uh, population around 500,000. Uh, it's the least populated region in the state of Georgia. Uh, also the poorest region of the state, uh, 
over 25% of the residents uh, live in poverty uh, since approximately 1995. Uh, Albany, which is the largest city in Southwest Georgia, um, demographics you see there, uh, about 70% uh, African-American, 20% white, and then others. Um, most people in the outlying communities travel to Albany for care, especially if it's complex uh, surgical care. And most people in the surrounding counties drive, you know, over four, 40, 30 to 40 miles uh, to, to get to surgical care in Albany. Albany is, um, is you can, might imagine, a very rural area in the southwest part of the, located in the southwest part of the state. Um, you can see there uh, in the, where the, the star is located. That is uh, EMS Region 8. And uh, these areas depicted on this map show the trauma centers throughout the state. You can see most of the trauma centers are located in the northern, middle to north Georgia. There's a really a trauma desert in southwest Georgia. Um, we are actively seeking uh, level two designation to provide uh, care for those patients. Currently, uh, most of the um, severely injured patients have to travel uh, to make an, uh, our nearest level one, which is uh, about an hour and a half uh, by car. So our resource challenges in, in our Southwest community are um, for the most part, lack of general surgery and surgical subspecialty coverages, coverage at the outlying hospitals. Um, as I mentioned, lack of a state designated trauma center in Southwest Georgia. And, all, and Phoebe Putney is actively seeking that designation. Um, we have difficulty recruiting surgeons to this region um, because of the, the rural nature. Um, we've been seeking uh, orthopedic uh, traumatologists for over a year. Uh, we also have um, needs for uh, oral maxillofacial trauma uh, surgery and uh, an ENT. Um, some of the outlying hospitals, there's a lack of ICU coverage. So even though they might have a surgeon available, uh, they still wind up sending those patients to Albany uh, because they don't have uh, surgical uh, ICU coverage. Um, and then the other issue for us is closure of critical access hospitals. Um, around seven hospitals in the state of Georgia, critical access hospitals have closed over the past few years. And we recently lost uh, one critical access hospital approximately 30 miles away uh, due to the uh, pressures brought on by COVID. Most of these hospitals are, are very marginal in their financial situation. And when COVID uh, came about, it was just too much for them to bear. And so, so we lost another hospital in, in the southwest part of the state. Um, those are my initial comments, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Uh, thank you. Okay, so um, my name is Sean Runnels. I'm an anesthesiologist. I'm at the University of Utah, and I spent three years um, in uh, on the continent of Africa. I spent one year with Mercy Ships, was a, which was a, a surgical hospital on a ship, and then I spent two years um, with Rob, actually, in the HRH program, a large capacity building program. Um, what I learned in Africa is humans learn really well by story. So I'm going to tell you a quick story about my uh, about my one of my first experiences in the HRH program. Um, I was there for about three days, and Natalie, one of our pediatricians um, in the HRH program, called me and said, "You know, hey Sean, can you come over to the pediatric ward, um, like ASAP? We have a kid that's about to arrest." And so I I dashed over there and. Um, and indeed, there was a child, a nine-year-old um, little girl who was unconscious and satting 60% um, uh, in extremis and about to arrest. There were 
uh, a few African um, doctors and nurses that I didn't have any idea who they were. They were just people in the room and they didn't seem to be doing anything. They didn't really seem to understand that the crisis was about to happen. And uh, they had oxygen hooked to the patient in a bag mask, um, but they really weren't delivering uh, you know, good care to the patient from what I could see. Um, and uh, the oxygen wasn't even hooked to the, uh, to the bottle and the bottle, um, you know, was was so there was no oxygen really extra oxygen being delivered bag mask was um was not really happening efficiently so i you know i'd been in africa for a year i knew i didn't want to just barge in and take over um but that's exactly what i did i did it subtly um i grabbed the mask and and quickly you know i said oh is there oxygen on in the tank and and um and uh, kind of took over and um got the, the child sat back up and was able to, Natalie and I rustled up an endotracheal tube and we intubated the the, uh, the child and um, kind of stabilized her and then went looking for an ICU bed. So, you know, from the standpoint of where my brain was when I entered HRH, um, that was all appropriate. I was there to take care of patients and save, um, you know, as many as I could. Um, however, the rest of that story is that that child had cerebral malaria. Um, she was brain dead and uh, the African physicians, one of which was Willie Kirvu, who was the uh, ICU attending, um, trained in France, extremely capable, way smarter than me and uh, understood the context he was operating in. And everything they were doing, the parents had, had spent time and money coming from Congo to get there. And uh, they had brought their patient, the African docs were demonstrating that they were doing something but they certainly weren't going to tie up a ICU bed with a brain dead African child. And so everything Natalie and I did to rescue and save that child was completely inappropriate in that setting. We were there to capacity build, not provide capacity. And that was the big lesson for me with our HRH. HR, you've got to understand what your mission is. And the primary missions, everybody talks about capacity building, capacity building, capacity building, but it's all too easy to fall into a capacity provision mode, which is really, really in sync and harmonized with where our brain is when we go to Africa to work um, or we go any place to work. And that's completely um, in harmony with what we're trained to do every day as American physicians, which is to prioritize the doctor-patient relationship. And when you're capacity building, your primary relationship is with the physicians and the staff, because they're going to be the ones that you transfer skills and knowledge into, and, tra and they're, and they're going to transfer a lot of skills and knowledge back to you. And that transaction through the, the local physicians is what contextualizes and makes sustainable medical systems. And all too often what we saw or what I saw on a, the HRH program is people can, came and when they're stressed, they automatically fall into that rescue mode. And that's very comfortable for us, but you, you, hear, um, you can hear it, uh, hear it in the language we use, my service, my patients, and I was always, we would always correct people to, uh, these are actually the Rwandans patients. This is their service and their ward. And if it's yours, then you're providing capacity. And as soon as you start focusing on individual patients, then you start allocating resources out of that system to take care of those patients. And, and that does real damage to the system because you have no idea of the context. I could stay in Rwanda for the rest of my life I never went through genocide. I never had to choose which child ate that day. I never had to watch any of my children um, be sick and, and uh, me not be able to do anything about it. And so the chances of me understanding Rwandan context is, is uh, very, very small. And that's why it's so important to partner with the Rwandans or with wherever you're capacity building and really trust them to set the principles and um, and then drive the programs. And a lot of times they will drive them in directions that you may not see as correct, but it's more likely that you don't understand the reality of the local context. So um, I applaud uh, everybody on this, um, this 
going to be a really nice panel, and I'm super excited to uh, participate in it. Thank you very much. I think this is dead air time. So, um, hi, my name is Lynn Tesh. First, let me say that I am honored to be asked to be on this panel. I feel a little overwhelmed at the experience and expertise of the other panelists and look forward to learning from them. I am a nurse, and so my perspective might be a little different. I hope that I may be able to contribute to the conversation today. Let me tell you a little bit about my background. I graduated from nursing school in 1980 before many of you were born. I'm a certified pediatric nurse practitioner from Emory and a family nurse practitioner certified as well. For most of my career as an NP, I have worked with the underserved. I worked here in Georgia at a private practice called Nuestros Niños, Our Kids Pediatrics, taking care of patients who, for the most part, were of undocumented, were children of undocumented Latin American immigrants. Then in New Mexico, I worked for Indian Health Service on the Navajo Nation. Two years ago, I returned to Atlanta and am now working for the BOP, the Bureau of Prisons, and the federal penitentiary here. I've also been involved in sporadic care, that is mission work in Guatemala, Tanzania, and Haiti. However, most of my out of country experience has been in Honduras. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. In 2002, I became involved with the mission group from North Carolina who had a relationship with an NGO in Southern Honduras. I'm sure many of you have been on mission trips and we all know how tricky those things can be. Part of that relationship between the mission group and the folks who received us in Honduras was with a group of health promoters, promotores de salud. These promotores worked with us and treated patients. They also requested that the group offer them some continuing education. So each time we went on a trip, we set aside one day for classes for them. As I got to know them and as I became fluent in Spanish, I saw a need and expanded this program. I recruited some donors and some volunteers and for seven years, I would go two to three times a year for two to three days at a time and offer various topics depending on who I could drum up to help me. I found a U.S. surgeon to teach suturing. I found a Honduran group to teach CPR. Um, I also found a Honduran doctor, MPH, who helped with various topics. On one trip, a health promoter taught us how to make um, natural medicines. We cooked up some homemade Vicks vapor rub. Both my volunteer work and my paid jobs have been in low resource situations. At Nuestros Niños, patients either had Medicaid or were self-paid. Therefore, choices were limited by insurance restrictions or by what parents could afford to pay. The poverty on the Navajo Nation is almost unimaginable. Unpaved roads, no running water, and no electricity are the norm. While each person is afforded free health care, the formulary is limited. Specialists within the IH system are IHS system are rare, and so consults or referrals must be requested and approved by finance. In my work at the prison, again, resources are limited. The formulary is even more limited than the IHS formulary, and getting an approval for a specialist not only involves the cost of the trip, but it also involves the cost of custody or security required depending on the risk level of the inmate. There are many times when working at these institutions that I have felt as limited as when I was on a mission trip in a developing country. All of my work has also been in cultures and languages different than my background. I have learned new languages, some better than others. You can forget Navajo. I've learned new vocabulary, new lingo. I have learned of different customs and beliefs. So what have I learned from all this? Be open. I can't assume that what I've learned in my own culture or in my education is true for someone else. Try to learn the language, the lingo, the vocabulary. It shows you care. 
Be ready to listen. You have to try to understand why a certain belief or behavior is happening, where it came from. Quoting the results of a double-blind study is not going to necessarily impress or change minds or behaviors. Be creative. If I can't write a prescription for something, I may need to find out how I can substitute. And it's really important to find local resources to collaborate with. They can help with spaces to work, advertising, discerning the best times and ways to offer care. And the most important thing is to be humble, which we all should be humble in medicine anyway. But we have to be ready to be wrong or at least not have the only right way. Again, my gratitude for allowing me to participate. Good morning, my name is Susanna Samaniego. I am joining you from Shiprock, New Mexico, where I work with the general surgery team at Northern Navajo Medical Center, which is part of the Indian Health Service. And I wanted to say thank you first to the Emory team for inviting me to speak and a big thank you to Alexandra and Sophia who worked so hard to put this program together. I just wanted to give you a few minutes on my non-traditional journey through medicine and remind everyone to enjoy the journey. Sometimes we work so long and so hard to achieve a goal that we forget that the journey is, is a big part of that. So I started my journey out in the DC area. That's where I was born and raised and went to school in the Midwest then uh, enjoyed some time out on the West Coast in Los Angeles before deciding to be a doctor and returning to the Midwest to train in medical school, decided to be a surgeon and uh, did my surgical training in New York City. And I had worked so long and so hard in that journey to become a surgeon that when I finally achieved that, decided, well, what now? I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to be a general surgeon I knew that I wanted to work with communities that had limited resources. And so I thought that I would go and be a part of Doctors Without Borders. So in my chief year, I said, hey guys, let me be a part of this amazing program. And they said, that's wonderful. We want you to join us, but in two years when you have some real world experience. And now I look back at that and realize how wise they are and I, was at a loss to where to go next. So I was at the American College of Surgeons meeting and I went to one of the exhibition booths where they uh, learned about locums opportunities. And in my training, I had never heard about what locum surgery was. So I ended up joining a locums company and specifically looked for opportunities in underserved locations throughout the United States. And I worked everywhere from Canadian border upstate Maine with potato farmers to sugarcane workers in the Big Island of Hawaii to uh, farmers in central Kansas and everywhere in between. And it was an amazing experience in learning how to work interdisciplinary teams in providing medical care in limited resource settings. Um, so that was a wonderful experience. And one of the places where I worked in locums was on the Navajo reservation here in the American Southwest. And I met some friends who are now friends for life who were working with a, an organization out of UCSF. It's uh, the HEAL initiative, which is their global health um, fellowship that is a two-year program. It's interdisciplinary, takes uh, specialists of all types, and um, you do one year domestically in the Indian Health Service, and you do one year abroad. And so I spent time in Shiprock, New Mexico at Northern Navajo Medical Center for my year domestically, and then I worked with Partners in Health Mexico, Compañeros en Salud, in Chiapas, Mexico, in a small rural community in the mountains of um, the Pacific South. And that was another experience in amazing interdisciplinary work, trying to pull together all of our armamentarium to provide care. 
And after finishing with my time in Mexico, I was able to come back to the United States and Shiprock asked me to come back to them and join them where I now am a full-time general surgeon on staff. And uh, I think that throughout that journey, I've definitely seen a lot of ways that we can work together in an interprofessional way to achieve quality and safe patient care in places with very limited resources. Hello. Thank you for listening to all of our panelists and we'll now start the live Q&A session. Um, my first question I would like to pose to Dr. Leon Dent. So Dr. Dent, um, you've worked in a lot of big systems, Harlem, Grady and Atlanta. My first question to you is, now that you're living in a smaller city and working there, how can these larger systems help support patients and providers in a more rural setting. Are, I, I'm sorry, I missed the first of that. Was that addressed to me or to any? No, I'm sorry, that was addressed to Dr. Dent. Okay, got it, sorry. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Could sure, you... so Dr. Dent, my question to you was, you've worked in some very large health systems, Harlem, Grady in Atlanta, and now being in Phoebe Putney in a smaller rural setting, how do you think that our systems overall can help better support patients and providers in rural areas? Okay, uh, great question. Uh, let me start out first by saying what hasn't changed uh, in the setting, and that is um, poverty. Uh, you know, inner city uh, and rural poverty, that's sort of what drives a lot of the problems that we have. And so that that part hasn't changed. Um, I think what has changed is the, the distances, of course, over which we have to provide care and, and, the, and the way we have to communicate in order to take care of patients. Um, I think what we try to do, at least from a trauma standpoint, is more outreach uh, to the smaller communities. And I think that's, that's where we really can make a big difference. Um, you know, collaborative sessions, uh, either going out in the community or having them come to Phoebe Putney has been has been great for us, and we've seen a lot of improvements. My next question is both for Dr. Reynolds and Ms. Tesh. So both of you mentioned some key things. Those being, uh, Ms. Tesh, you said humility in working with your populations, and and Dr. Reynolds. Uh, you've talked about understanding the culture in which you're at. So can each of you, starting with Ms. Tesh, talk about when you enter those areas and you're new there, how do you go about understanding the new culture that you're working in? Thanks for that question. And Dr. Runnels, I appreciated the story that you told in your introduction, um, because I think it is important for us to know what we're doing when we're there, but also to, to, to really try to understand the culture. I think the most important thing we can do is listen because there's so much of what we know in medicine that we have these studies and, and we know what the data is, but we don't know what people live. And what people live is maybe a little bit different. And maybe it turns around and comes to the um, studies. I can tell, a story of when I was working with a Hispanic in the Hispanic clinic, um, this guy came, this dad came in and he was worried because the fontanelle was falling on his baby. He would see it go up and down. And he, you know, he was asking me, what should I do? What should I do? And, you know, the baby was fine. And so the baby wasn't sick or anything. And so I finally got one of the uh, MAs to come help me. I did speak Spanish, but I thought maybe I'm missing something here. And 
And she said, yeah, what we do is if the fontanelle falls, we stick a finger in the palate and push it up or we turn them upside down. And I realized it's because they had seen babies dehydrated and their fontanelle fell and they died. And so they thought anytime the fontanelle might go down a little bit, that the baby was gonna die. And that was an aha moment for me to, to realize I was just discounting this person's concern almost and then realized where it came from. So if you stop to listen to the stories and get the, the why behind the, the what, I guess, you can really learn a lot about where where people are coming from. And then you can help them learn once you start from where they are, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Um, Reynolds? So, Lynn, um, yeah, Lynn, I think you're dead on. I'll try to express it maybe just a, from a different angle, see if we can, you know, help, uh, help people understand, because I, I think you're dead on. Um, one of the things that I, I think Rob talked about in his um, opening speech uh, about, uh, you know, the HRH program is we did a twinning process where we were working one on one with faculty and uh, and it didn't work out so well for some reasons. But I think the intent of that was important because the skills and knowledge um, or, the, you know, the, our, our skills and knowledge are meaningless in somebody else's context because you know what I found in um, in Central Africa and it took me a while before I had my aha moment. Um, I was in South Africa and I was talking to somebody um, who was a fully trained traditional healer, but he was Afrikaans, so he was white, understood the allopathic context, and um, and he said, you know. Um, Gosh, uh, that must be really interesting for you to be a Western allopath in the middle of um, Central Africa. And that, and he, he said, you probably wonder why your residents won't do histories. Like they will do them when you're there observing them, but then when you leave, um, they just walk in, kind of look and then make a diagnosis. And he said, that's because, uh, this is a very shortened version of the story, but um, that's because Africans in Central Africa are sick because of what's happening in the spirit world, not what's happening in the physical world. And so if you walk in as a healer and you start asking the patient questions, they're like, why are you asking me? You're the one with the gift to see into the spirit world. Um, and so you're projecting, you're, you're asking your residents to project themselves as a weak healer. And then the patients are like, we heard this all the time. Why are you asking me? You know, in many, many translated forms. And so the, the key is exactly what you said. Why do they perceive they're getting sick? How do they perceive you as a healer? And is that therapeutic relationship of seeing me in a white coat going to actually cause the healing that we need to take place? Because the chemicals, the molecules we use um, only have their maximal effect most of the time if people believe they're going to work. Um, if, if I go to a traditional healer and they're in traditional garb and do a traditional ceremonial dance, it's very unlikely that I'm going to get any placebo effect out of that. And so this is really based in science. The most important effect we have out there that's the most well studied and probably more powerful than a lot of medications we're using is the placebo effect. And so all of that, and that's not to say, I'm not sure what the point is other than it's really flipping complicated and it is deeper than we all think. And so the shortcut around that is through your twin. What Lynn did was she went to somebody who was embedded and embodied that context already. And she asked and said, what's going on here? And they offered the solution. And Lynn, I think that's, that's one little piece that you understand now, but there's a million little pieces oh, that yeah. we don't understand. And that's why it's so incredibly important to work through in HRH, it was your twin, painful as it may be, because your twin is gonna stand in the way of you taking care of patients. And just like anesthesiologists do not like to go to the ICU because I don't like to write orders that nurses have to carry out because they're in between me and my patient. Often when we go on missions or on uh, capacity building trips, <clears throat> we tend to, to, to push right through. We don't push our skills and knowledge and our efforts through the locals and then there's no real capacity built. And that's the, that, that is the single most important um, lesson that I learned is, is it's slower, but that's the way real capacity is built over time and it's painful for us. 
because we're not able to directly take care of the patient. So it's a lot more complex than we all think. So um, next question I have is for Dr. Samaniego, and then I have some questions in the in the chat that I find very interesting. So Dr. Samaniego, can you expand just a little bit on the HEAL initiative and sort of how that program is structured and why it's structured the way it is? Dr. Samaniega, can you hear me? All right, we'll come back to that question. I have a question um, from one of my colleagues. So Dr. Janavi Srinivasan is the program director uh, for surgery residents. Uh, and her question is interesting. So each of you, I'd like for each of you to comment. We'll start with Dr. Dent. What do you perceive are the biggest gaps in training to be prepared to deliver care in a lower resource setting. So what are the biggest gaps in training, whether that's from uh, your specialty uh, or Ms. Tesh as far as in the nursing setting? So Dr. Dent. Uh, I think probably the biggest gaps in training is just now that the residents are, are geared toward specialization um, and that's where the emphasis is. So the gaps I see are allowing residents to be ready when they finish to take care of a bread and butter general surgery. That's what these rural communities need. And um, we have, uh, you know, a lot of schools are, you know, are sort of t have tapped into that fact. And so they're rotating uh, students and residents to these rural communities. We have a, res a senior resident who comes from a medical college in Georgia and spends uh, two months with us in Albany. And I think that's helpful because they see a, a breadth of surgery and it's, it's bread and butter things uh, that they, they're gonna be required to take care of when they finish. Dr. Samaniego, I don't know if you can, if, if, you're, uh, if you can hear me again. Uh, would you like to comment on that same question as far as gaps in training uh, of our residents to prepare them to work in a low resource setting? All right, Ms. Tesh. Well, obviously I don't know anything about uh, residents training for surgery, but I would say just back to our previous conversation that I think what's important in nursing and medicine both is to continue the training, which I think is better now than it was when I first went to school about cultural awareness um, and to be aware of, of where you're working. I did work when I was at the Navajo Nation with we would get residents uh, and medical students from Emory, a lot from Emory would come and spend six weeks or eight weeks. And I was impressed with their, so this isn't a gap because I was really impressed with their their awareness of um, the differences and that sort of thing. So I think just to continue that is is really important. And like Dr. Dent said, to, to not always be looking for the big new uh, or fancy stuff, but the bread and butter because that's what most people live, you know, not the zebras, but the, the basic everyday, everyday stuff is what affect most people and that they need help with. Dr. Reynolds. Yeah, I think, you know, my guess is, um, is most of the, I'll speak from an anesthesia standpoint. Um, you know, most of the things we do every day, uh, we get really good at and, um, you know, what case is going on on the other side probably isn't as important, especially in a low resource setting, because you're not going to be doing cardiac bypass, aneurysm clippings, things like that. And so I think, you know, technically, folks are probably pretty well prepared. Um, the challenge is they haven't operated in that context, or they haven't, you know, not operated like surgically, but, you know, functioned as an anesthesiologist. And what we don't do a great job at is teaching the principles behind what we're doing. We, we uh, understanding that the equipment and the drugs don't make the outcomes, it's executing on the principles. And uh, in high resource settings, you can cover that up because you've got a hand to come in the room or a brain to come in the room that can help you sort things out. Um, and, and there's always more equipment and drugs available 
Um, so I think getting to the principles and saying, what is the basic thing I need to get done here? You know, which uh, Rwanda taught me really clearly um, that the basic first principle of anesthesia is not motionlessness or, um, or uh, painlessness or unconsciousness, it's delivery of oxygen to the alveoli. And we have so many ways to do that in the States that, that we don't really think about it on a daily basis. But um, turns out it's really, really important when you have a limited number of ways to do it because that becomes the overriding principle. And, and so I think getting people out to work in those contexts early as residents, um, that's one of the values uh, for, for anesthesia programs. If you go work in a local, uh, in a, a rural program, or in a, uh, a resource limited program, um, you can really learn a lot about the principles of what you're doing because you have to, you really have to use your brain more. Now, the challenge with um, international programs is, so you're benefiting from that. How do you make sure you're not harming the system by over allocating, you know, central lines to people that don't need them and, and using, you know, precious medications on patients that you want to take care of? So that's, that's the challenge. But I think, you know, there's no substitute, uh, to getting people out and and then and I think preparing them before they go so that they understand a little bit about more of the principles of capacity building and and hey you can harm while you're there and your the harm goes to the system not necessarily the patient and so kind of prepping people a little, little better before they go my answer to this particular question um because as many of you I've I uh work in the global health field as well and in low resource settings. Uh, my answer to this in terms of both anesthesia and surgery is two part. One, as Dr. Dent uh, said, teaching people the basics, having people have a broad scope of practice so they're not over specialized so they can do just about anything. Um, on the anesthesia side, I see, um, I see a deficit in residents that I take with me in understanding how to make a diagnosis and how to do things simply with the history and physical, using their stethoscope. Residents that mm -hmm. don't keep their stethoscope with them in the operating room in the United States, and then we, we go someplace else, and I'm telling them that that's, that's all they have. Um, the second part of that is... Going to a lower resource setting requires teaching people the basics of statistics. What's the positive predictive value of something? As Ms. Tesh said, you're, we're, we're running horses, not zebras here. And so what's the positive predictive value of what you're looking at? Do you really need that test? How much more is it going to give you? Um, and so I find, uh, I find basic physical exam skills and being confident in, in what you find out there and asking yourself, do you really need these tests to move forward? Um, and, and coming back to, coming back to wherever you're practicing in a, in a resource rich setting, um, you can then see people being more economical and, and not spending as much money on healthcare. Um, the next question I have, uh, the next question I have is, is, a perfect one for this day and age right now. So how do each of you see the capability and the collaboration of care with the use of telemedicine into low resource settings? Is it going to be enough to bridge the gap on the basics? So uh, Ms. Tesh, would you like to comment first about telemedicine? Um. Yeah, I have used that some when I worked in the Navajo Nation, and uh, we use it in the prison as well because um, there are certain specialists we don't have at the prison. Um, and, of course, the basic, it, I think it can work. I think it can work well, but there's the technology and there's the access. You know, that's the biggest problem, obviously. Um, do people have Internet? I mean, even today all of us, there were, there were problems, you know, trying to get all this connection going and we are in a resource rich area. So, or most of us are right now. So I think that's the biggest problem. Can it work? I think it can work. And I think it's amazing. We've all learned over COVID how you can have a relationship through this screen 
with people and it can be, it can be real. Um, we all miss the touching and the hugging and that kind of stuff. I think it can be real, but I think the biggest problem is probably going to be the, the technology and whether people have access. Dr. Dent? It's hard to do surgery through a telemedicine visit, but do you see telemedicine um, helping you down in, down in Albany? And there we go. <laughs> there it is. Uh, I guess it says it all. Dr. Salmoniego, are you back with us yet? I am. Thank you. So I would say that in places where connectivity can be so difficult, we found a workaround with uh, different apps like WhatsApp on our phones. And even to this day, the team that I worked with in Chiapas will shoot me pictures and questions. And I reach out to specialists in fields that I can't answer those questions for and see if they're willing to put their input. And it's not ideal. Um, it's not exactly what I would think of as a formal telemedicine visit where you show up in front of a video camera and can see your um, your provider on the other end. That would be amazing if we could work our way there. But in a place where the connectivity depends on the rainy season and whether the towers are up and if you have even electricity that day, that's not realistic at this point. So just reaching out in the ways that we can, finding workarounds, for example, those WhatsApp messages where you can take small snippets of video of a live handheld ultrasound picture so I can see what's going on and talk to the patient in terms of history and physical details and, and doing the best you can with what you have. Since your since your connection is very good right now, I'd like to go back to a previous question. So sure. I, I asked about um, if you could expand a little bit more on the Heal Fellowship and sort okay. of how that is structured and why it's structured the way it is. Absolutely. So this is my shameless plug for the Heal Fellowship. They are um, out of UCSF. It's their Global Health Fellowship, which is multidisciplinary in the sense that they have an arm that includes rotating fellows. So those are typically people within the United States medical system that are graduating from their designated specialty fields who want to join in a two-year program where they will do one year domestically, usually within the in Indian Health Service, um, and then one year abroad in their specialty in a location that we partner with. So those are the rotating fellows. And then the site fellows is the second arm. So for every rotating fellow who goes to a domestic and international site, those sites have the ability to nominate a site fellow that will join in the global health training platform that is for all of the fellows across the program. And then those site fellows are given the opportunity to use their allocated funds towards an advanced degree of their choosing. So depending on that site fellows field, for example, let's say we have a obstetrics nurse in Malawi who wants to go and get an advanced degree in obstetric nursing, then she can go do that and bring that home to her facility and um, provide better care for patients with her new knowledge and share that with her facility. Um, and then the rotating fellows also have that opportunity to pursue an advanced degree of their choosing as well. For example, I'm working on my master's of science in public health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And then through all of that, I become the poster child of, well, I did my year of domestic work at Northern Navajo Medical Center. And now that I finished with the fellowship, I have come back and have become a permanent staff member here. And uh, that seems to be happening across specialties in different areas throughout the program, which is really nice. It's wonderful. Thank you. Dr. Dent, I'm going to go back to you with that same question about telemedicine. Sure. It's definitely hard to do surgery telemedicine wise. However, yes. uh, how do you find telemedicine helping to uh, bridge that gap of resources in uh, in your setting there in rural Georgia? 
um, I think one of the things that's helped, at least during the COVID um, pandemic, we found that uh, having patients travel back and forth over long distances was a problem. Just, you know, bring them into the hospital because of COVID. So where I found that telemedicine really helped is for these routine post-op wound checks, for example, you know, rather than have somebody, you know, drive 30, 40 miles just so you can look at the wound and say, yep, looks great, you know, um, see you next time. So now, you know, we get a picture of it, of the wound. If it's not red or the patient's doing otherwise okay, then if, you know, a lot of times we don't need to see that patient right away, you know. Um, they can have their stitches removed locally in their, in their community. And uh, if they're otherwise well, we get a picture of the wound and uh, we move forward from that. So it saves a lot of clinic time and the patients to having to travel so far, just for routine things. That's wonderful. Um, and Dr. Runnels, as far as, uh, again, it's hard for us anesthesiologists to perform yeah. anesthesia uh, <laughs> telemedicine wise, but how have you found that working for you? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, exactly what you said, and I think what everybody else said is in very specific cases, like if I wanted to consult or somebody wanted to consult me on an airway exam, then I can have a chat with them about, you know, the different ways we might approach that airway. I can't necessarily currently be present with them as they uh, intubate, but um, you know that probably is, it's, it's all technically feasible. Somebody just needs to apply it. Um, so in, in the immediate term, in anesthesia, there's very specific stuff that could help. Um, and I do, you know, I have friends that practice in different places and we do show each other pictures and things like that and talk about things. So I think that works. The challenge, um, you know, is connectivity can be a problem. Time, um, you know, just the the physics of the way the earth rotates and um, is, is a real issue. Um, what I found in Rwanda, it, on the whole, it was more distracting to try to do that, um, you know, to connect back and forth. You know, the entire department would walk two blocks to get to the place where we could connect to have a conference, which meant that nothing was happening in the hospital where we were gone. And these things are all invisible to you know, us on the other side, but it can be really disruptive and um, and then really frustrating. There can be some learning that goes on. You know, I, I think that that's the immediate answer. Now, in the future, um, and this may sound pie in the sky, this is where AI should be incredible. Um, you know, you can embed one of the things that I, I do device development now and, and commercialization based on my experiences in Africa. And, and basically what you're trying to do is embed skills and knowledge into the tools themselves. So you think of a video, the Ringoscope right now, it's, it just shows you a picture and we tactically intubate with it. Um, it can understand how long you've been intubating. It can, we, we've got one now that, um, you know, can recognize the vocal cords, esophagus, tumors, epiglottis, things like that. It can remind you that, hey, this patient's human. They need oxygen as well as an endotracheal tube. So why don't you ventilate the patient? Um, and gentle reminders like that. Um, and so I think in the future, it's all about putting the skills and knowledge in the tools because that can shorten the training times needed. And that's going to be the real leap forward. Um, and that's where, you know, we need to be thinking, not, not rejecting technology, but really thinking about how not can it replace us, but augment our skills and knowledge. Because if we can move training from 10 years to train an anesthesiologist in Rwanda, to embedding the skills and knowledge that it takes to practice anesthesia and, and make that a two-year post high school training program, then you can meet the needs of the Rwandan people in about 15 years instead of 100. And, and that was one of my other aha moments is like, you know, if we go at this rate training anesthesia residents, it's going to be 100 years literally before we train enough to meet the needs of the Rwandan. So it's all about uh, skills and knowledge into the tool. And um, it, it will not help with context. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the challenges is the context is not going to be, we're not going to put that in tools. And that's where the humans will still need to, to apply those tools. But that's, that's way, you know, that's probably 10, 20 years down the future. But only if we make it happen. So I have one last question. Uh, this comes from, from one of the people in the audience as well. Um, so uh, they thank you for sharing your stories, and they were curious 
and I'm going to expand their question a little bit, but it's it, we don't have a lot of time, but they're curious to know how medical students, and I'd say nursing students um, and others, maybe uh, nursing, anesthesia, medical, whatever, but nursing students, medical students, how can they contribute to sustainable effects in resource-limited settings? And this is the key, and not be caught up in voluntourism. Mm. Mm, think about that for a second. Uh, Dr. Samaniego. Oh, don't try to pretend you're not connected. So I think that <laughs> I think that it's definitely a balance. Um, I think that everybody has a lot to give and share, but at the same time, a lot to learn and to be humble whenever you enter a new community that is not your own that you are not there to save the world and uh, change the system. You're there to listen to the people that live in that community and hear what their needs are and see if you can work with them to create a better program. Um, and it takes a lot of humility and it takes a lot of realizing just because you can doesn't mean you should. And that's a mantra that I always share with our visiting students and residents that you come from a background where many things are possible and you have unlimited resources to tap into and having a humble moment, realizing you're in a place where perhaps all those things are not available, then you should really think about what you can do versus what you should do in that moment in time in that place. Dr. Dan. Um, I think I agree with, with, with everything that, um, Dr. Samiego said, it's, I think medical students have limited experience, limited skills, but what they are, or potentially they can be great ambassadors. And so I think that um, by them listening to the stories that they will hear uh, during their rotations um, and um, just, just being there for comfort, you know, uh, being there to learn, being inquisitive, all those things uh, will have lasting effects on the, on the people that they serve. All right, Ms. Tesh, again, so how can nursing students contribute to sustainable effects in resource-limited settings without falling into the volunteerism trap? What do you think? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's okay for all of us to to volunteer and and to we all want to go help. That's why we're doing this, right? But just to echo that when you go, you're almost going to learn more than you're going to serve. I mean, you want to you don't want to do, you know, you want to do something. But the main reason that we're doing what we can bring back and use is to listen and to learn and to be humble just like Dr. San Diego said, to be humble and to listen and to learn and, and to not have this idea that we're going there to give because we're probably getting more than we give. You know, we want we want to give some, but to, but to use that less for us I, or, or more for learning than for um, trying to be the do-gooder, I guess. And Dr. Runnels, uh, 15 yeah. seconds. Unfortunately, we're coming to the end. Okay. Yeah, I think individuals are likely to do more harm. I think this is the responsibility of the organizations they work in. Yeah. And this is where we've really fallen short. We should be looking at this as a specialty with a body of knowledge that you need to be able to do because you're going into somebody else's system and you can cause harm. We would not let a, patient, a, a medical student just go operate on somebody and yet we'll let them unsupervised go into a system where their natural tendency is gonna be to do exactly what Lynn did, apply, give, 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 because that's where we're coming from. That's where our heart is. And so I think we need to elevate this to a specialty with, a, uh, with models with understanding of what we're trying to do. Are we capacity building? Are we providing capacity? And uh, we need to prepare people way more than when we let them go into these systems. Sending individual students um, or learners into somebody else's system is, I, I see it almost always ends in um, more harm to the system. 
Well, I'd like to give a heartfelt thanks to all of our panelists. You've been wonderful. Dr. Sean Runnels, Ms. Lynn Tesh, Dr. Susanna Summary, I apologize, Sarman Diego, and Dr. Leon Dent. But I would also like to make sure once again to thank Dr. Alex Wrights, our Global Surgery Fellow, and Sofia Stalianos, our medical student, both of whom helped work really hard to put this panel together. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.